Greetings and welcome once again, friends. Uh, I trust that you've had a blessed week in the past. And I thank God for giving us all another renewed privilege to be able to come together, to reflect together, to share together, to praise God together, and to experience his leading in our lives. So welcome, and I pray that God will bless you abundantly as we reflect and worship the Lord together as a family. Let us bow our heads for prayer before anything else. Let us pray. Mighty God, what a special gift it is to experience your leading, your preservation, your safety. We thank you for how in your benevolent love you continue to guide, direct, encourage, and draw us nearer to yourself. Thank you so much for the hard, selfless labors of love that you perform, Lord, every day to assure us that God stands with us, not against us. Thank you, God, for the special gift of fellowship of having brothers and sisters who love the Lord, desire the Lord. And God, as we come together as a family, we plead that the Spirit of God would be strong, that we would be led, that we would please, Lord God, be washed and cleansed of every impurity of sin, that our eyes would be directed upwards, heavenwards, closer to thee, that we would learn to love you, Lord, like never before. Thank you so much for this special gift. Please guide us. Please direct us. Please counsel us. And thank you for blessing us with this family. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. We have but two questions for today, and we pray that God will lead us as we as we go through the questions by God's grace. So praise God, praise God indeed for that special, special gift. All right, so our first question for today is, should the baptismal study be shared or taken up only by ordained ministers or evangelists or elders? So that's the question. Should the baptismal study be shared only by ordained ministers or evangelists or elders? Now, that's interesting. And I'd like you to go with me to the book of Ezekiel. And there's a, a beautiful word God gives to Ezekiel as he desires for him to go share this word with his people. And so it's interesting how what he's supposed to instruct the people with how he's prepared with that word to be able to go share that with the people. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. And let's see what the Bible says. All right. Okay. Ezekiel is in conversation with the Lord. The Lord is sending him to a people who are hard-headed, a stiff-necked people, a people who would not accept the leading of the Lord. And the Lord even makes it clear to Ezekiel, I'm sending you amidst a people who are that stiff-necked people who will, who will not reject you. In fact, God says, I'm not sending you to a foreign nation that don't speak your language, in a sense, because if I do, I know they will listen to you, but rather I'm sending you to a people who are your own and, and will not accept you. So it's a, it's a really high, it's a very challenging task. So it, it, it's mighty, it's mighty what, what, what God is saying. We find a reflection of that very experience at the end of the Bible, also in, in Revelation 10. Uh, let's, just, let's just take a look at that too. Revelation 10 speaks of a similar experience that is also taking place in the book of Ezekiel. So let's take a look at both those passages and, and what God is saying. In Revelation 10 also, at the end of time, we find, uh, and for those of you who have gone through the, the series on Revelation, you would remember in Revelation 10 verse 9, John representative of God's end time remnant is standing in the face of that mighty angel who's actually Jesus. And in verse nine, he goes to him, to the angel in Revelation 10 verse nine and says to him, give me the little book. 
And he, the angel, Jesus says to him, take it, eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And that's his experience. He takes the little book out of the angel's hand, eats it up. It was in his mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, he says, my belly was bitter. And we recognize that's the preparation to speak. He says, you're going to eat it. And as you share, it's going to be sweet in your mouth, but bitter in your belly. And it's interesting to know that that is the experience of, of the Advent movement, how the brethren were going out with the understanding of, of, of the prophetic timeline. And while they were speaking of the coming of Jesus, it was a very sweet experience as they spoke of it. But then in 1844, not recognizing that Christ is moving to the most holy place ministry, they believing that Christ is coming to earth to cleanse it, we recognize that it was a very bitter disappointment, a very bitter experience. But we see this beautiful experience, take this little book and eat it, as in masticate upon it, make it a part of yourself. It, it is to be absorbed into your being, the word you are going to speak. We hear of a, we hear of a similar choice of words in, in God speaking, in God speaking to Ezekiel, you could read with me uh, Ezekiel 2, verse 8. We'll, we'll start there. Um, in fact, let's go even a little bit earlier than that. Ezekiel 2, verse 7. Notice what it says. Thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Right? So you'll speak my word. So that's easy, Lord. Lord, I could just sort of memorize what you have to say and give it verbatim word for word. And I guess that's, that's my work. But verse 8, the Lord says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Oh, interesting. So I'm not just going to speech train you, sort of these are the words supposed to say with the sort of the same grammar, the same emphasis, follow the same structural uh, construction that I give you. And rather... He says, now, I want you to be different. I don't just want you to be an orator. I don't just want you to be someone who is going to just speak words, but in character. Notice this. In character, I'm giving you the word, and I don't want you to be rebellious. In other words, the one presenting the word should not be rebellious like the people he's presenting the word to. Powerful themes here at play. Verse 8 goes on to say, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. There was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Ezekiel 3 and verse 1 tells us, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. Powerful. Eat this roll. And then, so this is what you have to say, but you don't memorize, you're supposed to eat it and then go speak. Verse two is equal three. So I opened my mouth and caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then I did eat and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And it's only after that in verse four that the Lord says, he said unto me, son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel speak with my words unto them after the word had been eaten, filling his bowels. That's when God says, now you could go and share it with the people. I think it's imperative to understand, friends, that sure, some may be in the position of a minister, some may be in the position of evangelists or elders. But friends, we want to recognize that there's more than just a position. Sure, one can be a minister and yet then start to live a rebellious life. I hope you understand that. God in speaking to Ezekiel is saying the one who shares the word should not be rebellious, should not be opposing in his life the very word he's presenting. And this is mighty. 
So it's not, it's not just, and while it's key to have doctrinal soundness, and that's why I guess perhaps many would suggest you need an ordained minister, someone who's gone through the rigors of seminary studies to be able to present. And it's, it's important to have doctrinal soundness, but along with that, it's also important to be obedient to the word you're presenting to others, to the word you're teaching to others. The real impact, friends, is in the life and not just the words. The real impact is in the life. If, if the word you're presenting to a Bible student is so powerful to you, and you're presenting it, wanting to convince the person, this is the truth, accept it. The person's looking for a glimpse of that truth in your own life. Brother or sister, if this is so convincing, how come I'm not seeing that reflection in your life? And sure, they may not perhaps ask it to your face, but they want to see what has this goodness, what has this power done in your life? And that I think is very key. And, and notice how in Ezekiel, God presents to Ezekiel, he says, I want you to eat the word. I want the word to be a part of you. See, when you eat something, you once it's in the mouth, reaches your bowels, you, you don't then control where the what you eat is going because then it gets absorbed into the system. And that's the analogy God gives to those who are about to go share. God says, let the word become a part of you that it may enable you to go forth and be able to share the word of God. And so that is what, that is what I believe is the requirement of the Lord. Individuals, and of course, God is demanding, not just expecting, God is demanding that his ordained ministers, evangelists, elders, church leaders, be individuals who are not rebelling against the word they're presenting. Rather, they're in harmony with the word that they're presenting to the world. That they are becoming examples of the very righteousness they're appealing others to walk in. And it's a, that's a beautifully profound principle that, that needs to be followed. By, by those who seek to share the goodness of God with others. It's a high calling, friends. It's a very high calling. All right. Um, our, our second question says, I have a group of, of non-Adventist friends, and they do not, and I do not know how to interact with my friends regarding the judgment, the second coming of Jesus. Uh, please guide me and, and appreciate, appreciate your desire to reach out to your friends. And I believe it is really the desire of the Holy Spirit at work in you uh, to be able to yearn, to, to share with others. Uh, I'm reminded of, of, of Jeremiah. It's one of my favorite texts in scripture. If you have your Bibles, uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse nine, notice what it says. It's a beautiful text. Jeremiah 20 verse nine, the Bible says, then I said, I will not make mention of him. This is Jeremiah speaking. I will not make mention of him is of God, I will not speak of him anymore in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary. I got tired, in other words, with forbearing. I got tired of keeping myself back, and I could not stay. That's a, it's one of the most beautiful things in scripture. It's actually one of the most beautiful texts in scripture. Where Jeremiah is, 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 is expressing how he views God in his life. And he's saying, I, I tried to keep my mouth shut. I tried and I said, you know, I'm not going to speak about God at all. But his word was like this burning fire. It's like I got tired of keeping my mouth shut. I had to tell somebody. It, it, one of those beautiful things there to to recognize Jeremiah's burning, saying, I just couldn't keep it in. And I firmly believe that evangelism is not something you teach, if I can say, because it is born out of a heart that's yearning to, to tell others. So sure, you can teach someone principles to follow and all of that. But again, if the heart is not burning to share, none of those strategies are going to be at work because it's then coming out of a form. It's not coming out of the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so I really praise God that the Lord wants you to, to share more about him with your friends. And, and I believe this, if, if you're seeking to reach out to friends, of course, whether non-Adventist or, or non-Christian, 
you want to start friends by by creating a bridge start from start from avenues that help you build a bridge rather than build walls so you want to recognize that as you're speaking with brethren in this case christian friends right you want to start by speaking of jesus of course you want to talk about the second coming of jesus so first start by talking of jesus talk about jesus life talk who he is emphasize the nobility the goodness the the loving nature, the long-suffering heart of God, the great sacrifice of Jesus, present all of that. And then start building. And while talking about, you know, and, and this is sort of the, the aspect of Christ that gets mentioned in, in, through a, from a lot of Christian pulpits about that loving, forgiving nature of Christ. And then as you build on this, then start speaking about why was this sacrifice? Why was all of this forgiving? Why was all of this needed? Start talking about the reality of sin and how, Without the law, without sin, makes no sense why Jesus had to die on the cross. Wages of sin is death. And if the law could just be put away, why did Jesus even have to die on the cross? And if the law is actually done away, Jesus' death on the cross makes no sense. Because the wages of sin is death, and sin is the transgression of the law. But if the law could just be sidelined, why was he even on the cross? So this is imperative, supremely imperative to to build rightly. And as people begin to see Jesus and experience a love for Jesus, they want to hear now how I and my sins have brought him through that suffering and point them to Hebrews 6, 6, how as we sin, we crucify him afresh to talk about the, the, the darkness of sin. Now, as you build on that and recognize, and as brethren begin to recognize, you know, my, my failure and how my sin wound him so much. That reality is presented to them. That realization, the call for purity through Jesus' life. Talk from scriptures that speak about the, the demand for living a Christ-centered life as you present those truths also in the light of scripture. Again, one of the key things, and this is going to be more needed when you start talking about truths that are not popular in many Christian churches, that's when this next principle will really have to hold ground, is that always let the Bible speak for itself. Always let the Bible speak for itself. And that's, again, a Bible principle. You can read about it. And let's go. Uh, we're reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. And notice what the Bible says. Um, starting from verse 9, right? Uh, Isaiah 28, verse 9, knows what the Bible says. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Right? So the question is, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom is he going to make to understand his doctrine? Of course, he says, them that are weaned from the milk, them that are drawn from the breast. In other words, those who are humble, those who are willing, those who are, although babes in the faith, and, but yet, with a serious hunger and thirst for righteousness, God says, I'm going to teach them. But then notice the method of instructions, all right? So this is really powerful in context. So God wants to teach people his knowledge, help them understand his doctrine, but how? Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So you recognize that's the Bible principle for Bible study. You're not presenting your ideas. You're presenting the word of God line upon line, precept upon precept. You're following a Bible principle in teaching. This is God's principle in teaching knowledge and help people understand doctrine. That's what you're seeking to reach out to your friends with. You need God's principle. God's way is the only way that's going to help you reach to your brethren. So you recognize as you build your foundation from the very life of Christ, sticking solely to his word, and as you build up further, people recognize, I'm not hearing my friend's thoughts, I'm hearing God speak to me through his word. That's what they go home with. Now, as they get all of that, that's when you start building, and you've come to the point where you start talking about the purity of sin, or well, purity from sin, and walking away from sin, and God's victory over sin. 
as you speak of all of that, then you start speaking of death. Of course, you, you start building onto all of these things. You start speaking of the second coming of Jesus. And as you speak of death and second coming of Jesus, these truths will become very clear from scripture. So you want to start building. You don't want to start by talking about judgment. You don't want to start by talking about the second coming. You want to start by creating that foundation based on the word of God so that when you start talking about deeper truths that are not popular, but you're still sticking to the word of God, you've not moved your, 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 you've not moved your method of teaching when you get to these deeper truths. When you stick to the same method, your friends recognize, oh, okay. What he's saying is, is, does not sound right to me, but it's Bible truth. He's not making it up. He's not sharing his idea. He's sticking solely to the truth, Bible truth. And keep emphasizing this. If it's in the word, it deserves to be heard. If it's not in the word, it doesn't deserve to be heard. It's a very simple, plain principle. Now, this is very important, friends, for we want to recognize that, and perhaps we hear this amongst other faith establishments where ideas are presented, but there's no foundation. And after years of many brethren in churches searching, they don't find a foundation for what they've been taught, for what they've been holding on to. They don't find a Bible principle. They don't find a Bible foundation for what they've been hoping. And that can become a very devastating experience for many. It can be a very destructive. Many could walk away from the faith altogether rather than search deeper. So it can be a very discouraging experience. And then whenever we present God's word, let it always be that God's word is speaking to the people, not, not our ideas and our thoughts. Even if those thoughts are true, I hope you understand this. Even if those thoughts are biblically sound, make sure it's not you speaking, it's the word speaking. And I, I hope you understand and don't not misunderstand what I'm saying. Although you may be presenting the right thought, make sure you're saying, well, what I'm saying is right here in the Bible. Let me show you the text. So always have the word. You may sure explain it more, clarify it more, paraphrase it as the spirit leads you to help the brethren understand, present examples. But make sure that the word remains the foundation. Now, if you're, if you're wanting to study more subjects like the second coming, the judgment, uh, we were just having a series with Brother Dakota. You'd have, you'll have ample material to study from there. We'll have other brethren who must have shared on the same subject of the second coming and judgment and death and uh, other, other more other sacred truths that, that are really not popular. So go through those studies, study those truths deeply for yourself before you go. As going back to our, to our first question, eat these truths, make it a part of your system, make it a part of yourself before you go out to, to share it with the world. It is imperative that the word is not just something we know intellectually, the word is a piece of us. We, the word is now in control of us. It is it has been absorbed into the system and we're living out, 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 out that word in our lives so that the world is able to see the very truth we're seeking to present to them. So I, I hope that sort of uh, helps us see the matter a little bit clearer and I hope that that has helped. So praise God for that. Praise God for that. Well, we only have two questions for today. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And we praise God for his loving faithfulness in guiding and directing us in, in, in all of our, our deliberations and our sharing. So praise God for that. Thank you for your support and your prayers. We're going to pray now and uh, thank God for blessing us in this time. And please feel free to send in your prayer requests after that. And we'll close with a final prayer uh, with those prayer requests. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you again. It is such an honor to be led, to be blessed, to be directed, to be taught and to see you present these beautiful truths from scripture. It's such a blessing, Lord. It, truly, there's never been a time we've come to the word and gone away without a blessing. We've always gone with you shining light upon us. It's, it's been such a heavenly gift. Thank you, God, for these blessings. Help us to remember to share this light with the world and never limit it to ourselves. May your name continually stand praised and exalted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.